we are moving on to the first panel of the day, BC Natural Resource Industries Working Together. Before we begin, we are pleased to note to our viewers that this panel has a live Q&A component in Whova following the opening comments. If you're on your computer, look to the right of the video screen and you can select the Q&A from the top right-hand side. If you're on your mobile device, select the Q&A on the left-hand side under the video screen. Please vote on the questions you wish to have answered by the panel and ensure you're in the correct session prior to submitting your questions. Now, I'm delighted to introduce this session's sponsor, ConocoPhillips, to introduce our moderator and welcome our panel. Hello, my name is B. Jagawal, president of ConocoPhillips Canada. ConocoPhillips is proud to sponsor the BC Natural Resources Forum again this year, an important event for information sharing among government, industry, and Indigenous communities on the state of natural resource development in British Columbia. I'd first like to acknowledge that in BC, ConocoPhillips operates on Treaty 8 territories, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, and Danaza people. We acknowledge that this territory is also home to Métis communities. The theme of this first panel session, moderated by Fiona Famulak, President and CEO of the BC Chamber of Commerce, is Natural Resource Industries Working Together. Responsible development is crucial and cross-industry collaboration has never been more important as ConocoPhillips Canada and all Canadians embark on strengthened relationships with Indigenous communities built upon the principles of reconciliation and as we tackle cumulative effects management. Nowhere are these trends more prevalent and the opportunities as great as where we operate in Northeast BC. Forums such as this are an essential venue for collaboration as we share successes, learnings, and opportunities for a shared future. I look forward to learning from today's panelists and thank them and the conference organizers for gathering us together today. So thank you again to Fiona for moderating, and now I'd like to turn the virtual mic over to her. Fiona? Thank you, Bij, and thank you to ConocoPhillips for your, your sponsorship of the forum. It's very much appreciated. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, before I kick off the, the session today, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking with you today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And as an immig immigrant to Canada, I acknowledge that Indigenous people have always been here that we all have a role to play in reconciliation, and I am incredibly grateful to live, work, and play on these lands. This year's forum is focused on building and maintaining BC's natural resource sector uh, in BC and also in, in Canada, and to, um, to look forward and to, to figure out how we're going to prosper in these um, new times, the new reality, and in uncertain times in terms of economic times. I'm honoured to moderate this first panel today, and I know that we're going to have a thoughtful, candid, and I think provocative conversation, um, engaging four esteemed leaders from our BC natural resource sector. I'm delighted to welcome this morning Susan Yurkovich of the Council of Forest Industries, Brian Cox of the Canadian LNG Alliance, Kendra Johnson of the Association for Mineral and Exploration, and last but certainly not least, Michael Goring, President and CEO of the Mining Association of BC. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As, good morning. You're looking good. As the, uh, as the moderator for this session today, my goal is to pack in as many questions as possible to the time that we have allotted to us. Um, however, as Sarah just mentioned, the audience is able to participate um, as of now using the Hoover app. So please submit your questions and I will try to get to as many as possible in the time allotted between now and 10.45. And before I launch into the Q&A session, I want to frame up this conversation today touching on three points that I know we're going to dig into deeper over the course of the next hour. I want to touch on the importance of inclusion. I want to in touch on the importance of unity versus division, and also the importance of working together, which is our panel's discussion point uh, and title this morning. 
So let's, uh, let's go back to the importance of inclusion just for a moment. The BC Chamber of Commerce membership comprises corporate members and also almost 100 local chambers of commerce and boards of trade from across the province. And we represent small, medium and large businesses from every corner of the province and I believe from every industry imaginable in the, in the province. So we have a wide reach. Um, I mention this because um, in our perspective at the, at the Chamber, all sectors have an important role to play in our economic and, and social well-being. And we absolutely acknowledge the fundamental role that BC's natural resource sector plays, not just in the past and now, but certainly going forward. The BC resource sector has a fundamental role to play in both our economic and social well-being. And we'll dig into that a little bit deeper this morning. Secondly, I want to touch on the importance of unity versus division. Now, as a society, I believe that we need to move away from the, the language of division. Um, supporting one another and, and working together has been fundamental to our collective success over the last two years as we've navigated a pandemic and is absolutely fundamental to our plotting our way forward and our economic and social success and future. And I know that the people watching us in the audience today will agree, um, natural resources is not a Northern issue and it's not a rural issue, it's a BC issue. Um, we don't really have Southern economies and Northern economies, we have a BC economy. Urban and rural prosperity in our view is absolutely interconnected and that's the way that we need to be thinking and, and discussing and moving forward. And we wouldn't be able to provide for our future generations if we continue to talk about industries of yesterday and industries of the future. If I think about the relationship between natural resources and clean tech and green economy, that relationship is symbiotic. They need each other and as a result of working together closely, they have positioned each other uh, and one another as global leaders. So it's not either or, it's all. And then lastly, the importance of working together, which is the title of our panel discussion this morning. I've had the great pleasure of working with Michael and Susan and Brian almost on a weekly basis for the last almost year uh, while I took on this uh, position at the, at the BC Chamber. And I can tell you, I have seen them in action and they are absolutely collaborators, not just for the benefit of their own sector and industry, but for the benefit of business as a whole. And I've had the great pleasure of just meeting Kendra 10 days ago and she says and acts in the exact same way. So I truly believe that as human beings, we are wired to help one another. Um, and we need to cut through perceptions, we need to explore, we need to have courageous conversations, um, get rid of the divisive rhetoric and the behavior, and let's move forward together, which is really what our panel title is calling for us to do today. And I'm excited to explore that for the next 45 minutes. So with that frame, I want to throw a question to the, uh, to the panel um, just to have um, a couple of conversa oh, conversations for the next two or three minutes around one question, and then I'll move around uh, the conversation um, as, we, as we get into it. So my first question, and Michael, perhaps I'll start with you. Um, we're, you know, as we plan forward and we're still navigating a, a global pandemic, what what sets BC apart from its competition today? And, and whatever that element is, is it hindering or helping our future success? Well, thanks, uh, Fiona. Uh, it's great to be here this morning um, on a panel with Susan, Kendra and Brian to talk natural resources. And I, I, I'd like to also add that I'm quite pleased to be coming to you today from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And um, I certainly, uh, was saddened that we weren't get coming together in Prince George, uh, but let's hope next year. Um, to your question, uh, BC natural resources have a number of characteristics, I would say competitive advantage um, that set our province apart from our uh, competition. And I think in a world where we're moving towards uh, a, a transition to a cleaner future, um, we'll, you know, um, enable us to capitalize and, and gain um, our collective success. Um, COVID certainly highlighted, um, 
you know, changes in the global economy and how volatile it is. Uh, but leaving aside that, I think um, the dominant issue, dominant issue that's emerged is climate change. And the two, you know, I'll start off, uh, you know, in answering your question, the two kind of key competitive advantages we have in British Columbia that I see through mining and in other resource sectors is our low carbon advantage um, and uh, responsible resource development. Um, so climate change is certainly uh, a core challenge to British Columbia. We all have to adapt and there's lots of work to do on that, but it's also an opportunity because uh, we have some of the lowest greenhouse gas emitting mines and smelters on the planet right here in British Columbia, thanks to our clean hydroelectricity and our engineering expertise. And I think, uh, and we'll hear from other panelists, I think that low carbon advantage holds holds true for other BC commodities. Um, this, this low carbon advantage gives us a unique opportunity to, to play an outsized role in supplying the world with the commodities it needs to transition to a cleaner, low carbon future. Um, in our sector, we see you know, clean technologies and green infrastructure driving uh, the clean energy transition. Uh, this in turn is, is uh, driving increased demand for minerals and metals like aluminum, copper, gold, zinc, steel making coal. And all of those are produced right here in BC. And um, I don't think a lot of people have truly got their heads around this yet, but the magnitude of this opportunity for BC becomes clear when you consider that the International Energy Agency estimates that globally, we will need up to six times more minerals and metals by 2040 to accelerate the transition and meet our Paris Agreement targets by 2050. So that's, I think, the first competitive advantage we have over uh, other jurisdictions. Our second uh, relates to the increasing demand for commodities that come from responsible sources. Um, changing societal values and customer preferences are driving demand for companies to meet more uh, stringent environmental, social and governance performance metrics. And I think everyone in the audience today would agree we do natural resources right in BC and we do them responsibly. So we're well positioned to emerge as a leader in providing responsibly sourced commodities. And um, you know, our mines and smelters operate responsibly, they operate safely. And in BC, we meet some of the toughest regulatory requirements in the world for environmental protection and worker safety. And we're, we're really proud of that. And we're also proud of the ongoing commitment, our ongoing commitment to continuous improvement and how that has been changing minds for the better. Um, I'll, uh, one more uh, competitive advantage and then I'll cede uh, the floor to my other panelists. And that is an area that I'm very optimistic about with respect to mining and, and, and the economy in general, and that's our ability to advance economic reconciliation. And mining is not unique in this regard, uh, but I think in our industry, there's a consensus that we wish to be allies and to be uh, proactive and, and um, productive partners with Indigenous nations. And we've become an important driver of economic reconciliation with Indigenous peoples uh, through partnerships, benefit agreements, uh, all of which reflect under principles. Um, and our members in recent years have become major partners with Indigenous businesses uh, and, uh, and employ significant numbers of Indigenous people. So mining has a lot to offer uh, this province uh, to future generations. And uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to the other panelists. Thank you, Michael. And I like the I like how you described it. We have an outsized role to play in um, in the energy transformation that we're all in. So uh, really good points. I want to come back to a few of those later in the conversation. Susan, I'll flip to you though. In your in your uh, perspective, what's the what are our competitive advantages, and do they help or do they hinder? Sure. Thanks, Fiona. I think you're going to hear some, probably some common themes, but um, I'm also joining you from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people and really happy to be here, although I would be way happier to be in Prince George uh, with Marilyn Hall and all of our friends from around the province. It's always a highlight to be at the Natural Resources Forum and I'll look forward to being there uh, next year in person, um, we all hope. Uh, 
clearly the forum is happening at a time when we've got a lot going on. We're continuing to tackle this very big health uh, challenge. It's also been an economic crisis of a generation. And we're starting to think about what does our economy and our society look like when we get to the other side. And, you know, in that context, we've got really changing expectations, expectations around important issues like climate are ramping up. People are demanding the carbon friendly uh, products that Michael talked about. Investors are, are looking towards companies that understand the importance of environmental and social governance. At the same time, we've got this geopolitical instability and protectionism and polarization, which you talked about, Fiona, in your opening remarks, that are disrupting our markets and our societies. And, and here at home, in our sector in particular, we've got these massive shifts in policy that are underway that, while well-intentioned, are creating this uncertainty uh, for British Columbians who rely on forestry and the natural resources sector as a whole. So. You know, it's in that context that I, I'll just highlight three things that I really think set British Columbia apart and I think sets us up really well to be part of the solution. And, and the first one is that the natural resources sector in British Columbia are foundational. It's probably not going to be a surprise to anybody who's a part of this conversation. But, you know, the natural resources sector has been a consistent contributor to the economic and importantly, the social fabric of our province. And that's been really true in the last couple of years in particular. Through the pandemic, it's the natural resources sector really that has been allowed to, in, in a large part, was able to get back up and running safely and continue to uh, employ people which supports families and communities and importantly provide important revenues to government and as the bc business council recently noted you know british columbia has actually been uh, doing better in terms of economic recovery uh, driven largely by the natural resources sector and led, I will say, by forestry that, of course, had a, an exceptional year as more and more people were shifting home and wanted to either have a bigger home uh, that was made from wood um, or also looking to do those DIY projects that have been on the honeydew list for a long period of time and then people had time to do them when they were at home. So, you know, it is really important. Um, you know, you talked about this outsized contribution and it's absolutely true. The natural resources sector contributes significantly to gov government revenues that support uh, important social services like hospitals and affordable housing and COVID relief. In our case, it's about four billion annually from the forest sector. And that's really important as we look to grow and sustain uh, the quality of life that we have uh, in British Columbia and improve it uh, for many who are, are looking for improvements. And we want to make sure that we're raising up all of society as we do that. But also importantly, as consumers are looking to the sustainably uh, produced and low carbon products, forest products included, um, as a materials of choice in the globe. The second thing that I would say is a strength and what sets us apart. And, and sometimes in all the noise, we can forget about who we are and what we accomplish on a daily basis as part of the resources sector. And so if you ask me what sets us apart, it's really our people. Um, to me, they are our secret superpower. And if you look across our businesses, you will find dedicated professionals uh, you know, in our case, doing innovative work to steward our forest resources, skilled workers who are producing beautiful low carbon products that are in demand around the globe, people who are looking for different ways to use our forest resource and the fiber in different products and in di different processes and looking for ways to partner with indigenous communities uh, across our province. And, you know, we've got a, a natural resources sector, they, they operate across the province and they tend to be deeply rooted in communities that they care about, that they care deeply about. And I think that also um, there are people that recognize that there's always room to change and to do better and strengthen that foundation. And so I think that's a real key strength for British Columbia. Uh, the third thing is what Michael talked about and that's this low carbon opportunity. We have in British Columbia, I think the amazing opportunity to be the global supplier of low carbon products and that's because we are so advantaged by our green electricity system which um, whether which we all benefit for but we also i think from our perspective need to acknowledge um, that forest products in, in all their forms are an important tool as we look to fight climate change products made from 
from wood or from forest fiber are a better choice for the planet because they capture car they capture cor carbon for the life of the product. And then as we, re we reforest, we have this uh, carbon capture vehicle for the life uh, while the tree is growing as well. And so it's really important to us that we see this opportunity. We see more and pe more people around the globe looking to products, low carbon products as part of their uh, tools to fight climate change. And we can be a part of that. You know, it starts with, you know, there's mass timber. We've is a start. And I know we're working on that in the province of British Columbia, but we have lots of other uh, value added opportunities uh, that we can capitalize on if we can attract the capital and, and take advantage of these opportunities in the years ahead. So just before I, I turn it back to you, Fiona, you the second part of your question is really what will, will help or hinder our collective su success. I'm going to focus on uh, what will help for our sector. Um, you know, really what would help uh, is having a balanced approach to forest uh, policy modernization that's underway here. We need a fact-based approach um, and that it's only going to be uh, informed uh, with good science and in traditional knowledge and by making sure that we have an inclusive pro process that you talked about, which means having everyone at the table. I think the second thing, and this, this, you know, we talk about it in the forestry context, but I think it applies to all the natural resources sector is, is you know, is pr predictability. In forestry, predictable access to fiber at a reasonable cost is absolutely the key to being able to capitalize on some of the opportunities. You know, part of that is having clear rules and transparent and timely processes that'll encourage people to think about making plans for the future. And you know, if any of you were at the truck loggers last week, we heard loud and clear um, from the investment analyst, Paul Quinn, um, you know, that persistent uncertainty is making BC, in his view, uninvestable. And we need to change that. And we need to do that as a collective if we're gonna be able to capitalize on the opportunities that are in front of us. And finally, I think to your point again, Fiona, at the outset, inclusion and unity, we certainly as the resource sector work together all the time. Um, but I think it's something that, you know, we know that partnership is key. We have, we all uh, want our businesses to thrive and to take advantage of these opportunities. But, you know, governments, labor, indigenous nations, communities and companies, no, no one can do this alone. It has to be a collective effort. It requires us coming together, which is what we're, you know, we're going to be talking about today. And I, I look forward to uh, the discussion that's ahead. So thanks very much. And I'll turn it back to you, Fiona. Thanks, Susan, and thanks for building on Michael's comments about the opportunity we have as a low carbon um, driver and world leader, and also for highlighting, and I think it's common knowledge, our, our people. Um, uh, success is grounded in the people um, that we have um, throughout BC, so thank you for that. Kendra, I'll ask the same question of you. Sure, it's, uh, I, I think, as Susan said, there's a lot of similarities between uh, where we're all going and, and what the themes are that we're going to hear today. And, and really, it's hard to come up with uh, something beyond what, what Michael and Susan have said, because those are really our key advantages, uh, everything that they've touched on. So uh, I couldn't agree more. But uh, uh, I would like to just start by saying that I, as well, am coming to you from the uh, traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil uh, And it's an absolute pleasure to be here and uh, to be really in such proximity to, uh, to the others on the panel. I uh, could see myself out uh, Michael's window there um, watching his uh, opening comments. So uh, pleasure to be here and, and thank you so much Fiona for hosting this panel as well. Um, I think really our competitive advantage is what has always been our competitive advantage here in BC and that is the sheer wealth of the natural resources that this province has. It is something that we rely on. It's something that we have always relied on. It is foundational and to remember that and to realize that as we go forward and just keep thinking about that as we build and as we grow. I think that's a really important piece to uh, to be thankful for for each and every day and to maintain for future generations. We spend a lot of time working with Indigenous nations across this province and that is a real true value for them is protecting the land, making sure that it's there for future generations and I think that's a piece that really is society as a whole we need to encompass and take on for ourselves and believe going forward. And in your opening comments, Fiona, you talked a little bit about the um, the urban rural divide to some degree, and and you called it um, unity and, and division. But in a lot of cases, that's 
that's what we're talking about is the the rural the rural and the the urban piece and i think that's something that we forget when we're in the cities is is really the impact of uh the natural resources and the environment around us and as part of um, being as being part of the mineral exploration community, it's it's something that's near and dear to me. It's the reason why many people uh, in our industry go out and become geologists. It's it's their love for hiking and for being out in the wilderness and really truly enjoying that landscape. So, I think for me, the, the competitive advantage that really sets BC apart is the sheer wealth of our natural resources. I think the other one for me, and and it goes uh, follows really nicely on Susan's comments is the people. And I think over the last two years, through all the change, through all the challenges, through all the opportunities that we've seen, it's really been our people that have come together. The kindness that we've shown each other, the understanding, the getting to know our neighbors down the street, that would not have happened over the last uh, couple of years without this pandemic hitting. So as much as it's been an extreme challenge for all of us to continue to work, to put in new layers of protection, to understand what's going on, not only in our corporate offices, but on our various field sites across the province. There really have been some positives that have come out of those conversations as well. Uh, I would add to that list of positives the sheer uh, gravity of some of the social conversations that have happened over the past two years. Um, Black Lives Matters has become extremely prevalent. Diversity and inclusion has become a very common phrase in every boardroom uh, across this province, uh, and it should be. It's actually, you know, well past its time. We have talked uh, in mineral exploration and mining uh, about women in mining for a long, long time, but that conversation has now widened uh, to be more diverse and more inclusive. Um, and it relates not just to bringing people into the fold and into our industry, but in how we work every day with every individual that wants to be in our industry. So I think that's a really important competitive advantage as well as our people, uh, the knowledge that they have and the passion that they have for this industry. In BC, we are a center of excellence uh, in natural resources and certainly in mineral exploration and mining with the number of engineers that we have, the number of geologists, the regulatory officials, the lawyers, the financiers, Everybody who's involved in this industry is here because they really, truly love what they do. And they've chosen to be in BC because of the, the ecosystem that we have here. And finally, I think our third competitive advantage is really the rigorous, transparent and efficient regulatory uh, system that we have in BC. And I know that's going to be slightly controversial, perhaps to uh, some of the folks on the phone, but the intent is there to have a really strong regulatory system. And when we compare our regulatory system uh, to those around the world, we have one of the best systems out there. There's lots of changes that could be made. There's lots of improvements uh, and certainly on the efficiency front, there are, are uh, lots of lots of growth opportunities there, um, but really it is competitive. It is, uh, and it, it holds up when financiers are looking at projects from around the world and comparing one jurisdiction to another, uh, they come to BC because of the rigorous system that we have. So um, I'm gonna leave it there. I'll pass it back to you, Fiona, and look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks, Kendra, and thanks for putting that in perspective. You're right, nobody's perfect. Um, However, compared to others, we're doing uh, well. And I would say that in, in terms of how we've no navigated COVID and how we're positioning ourselves for the future, is there room to grow? Is there room to improve? Absolutely. And I'll dig into that um, as we get through the conversation. Last but not least, Brian Cox, in your view, uh, what sets BC apart from its competition? Thank you, Fiona. Uh, it's so great to be here today. I really wish I was in Prince George too, uh, chatting to you all. Great to be here with my colleagues, though. I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the KT, Kwantlen, and Semiamu people. Uh, what sets BC apart? It's our diversity, folks. It's the diversity of our people, the diversity of our ideas, the diversity of our land, and importantly, the diversity of our economy. What other province in this country could forward face these leaders across mining, across LNG and natural gas, across forestry with authority that we are all world leaders in these industries. We have an incredibly diverse economy and it's, and it's thanks to all of you that are listening today. So let me let me say thank you. Doesn't matter if you're in forestry or mining or natural gas and LNG or run a river or geothermal, you name it, you're part of the solution right now. And uh, the diversity of what we do in British Columbia is our absolute strength. And it's also um, 
you know, juxtaposed with where we're at as a society right now, which is uh, talking about things in terms of black or white. We have a false narrative right now that, um, you know, that it's my team or your team, that we need more of some things and less of other things. And I think it's, it's easier to do that in a province like BC because of the diversity of our economy. The path forward is around multiple pathways and solutions to that. That is what will lead us to the what outcomes that we're trying to get to, which is obviously decarbonization, advancing reconciliation, and empowering thriving communities from top to bottom of our province. And doing that will happen when we advocate for multiple pathways. And that's the thing about BC and more generally in the world, it's been, COVID has really driven us into our corners. It's pushed us into our teams. And our opportunity now is to come out of our corners and engage in different ways around those multiple pathways to solutions. And that's gonna take a different way of advocacy because we generally advocate uh, on you know what we think our solution is but the fact of the matter is that it's going to take multiple solutions for us to achieve what we need to achieve as as a province and as a country and so you've heard it from my colleagues i agree with with so much and pretty much all of what they've said around our strengths are and what we have an opportunity to do as a province and as a country and it's going to take a different conversation we can't keep having the same conversation. It's going to take vulnerability in different ways than we've seen before. And we as leaders need to be at the leading edge of that and talking in different ways, particularly as business leaders. You know, not, uh, metrics around GDP are very, very important. However, we need to engage with British Columbians in a different uh, way around the so what of why our industries are important but why it's so important that a project like LNG Canada and Ghost Coastal Gas Link have been able to, to stay in construction throughout this last two years, providing prosperity across the province, across the country, opportunities for reconciliation, because we all want the same things, those healthy, strong families, economies, local com uh, economies and, communi and communities. So I believe 2022 needs to be a, a different story, a different way of advocating to, to give us all the space, the space to have conversations again, a space to get back to talking about the diversity of our province, the multiple pathways, and the fact that natural resources and these amazing uh, industries that we all represent are at the center of it. So looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Brian. And I think you summed up this conversation or this part of the conversation really nicely by saying our superpower is the diversity of our people, ideas, land and economy. Absolutely. And the need for courageous conversations, um, curious conversations about what the others are thinking as opposed to making assumptions about it. So thank you, everybody, for setting a really broad uh, table. We could be here for hours. Unfortunately, we only have 25 minutes left. So let's keep going. Um, I want to go back before we go forward. I want to, and just to kind of give the, the panel a heads up, um, I want to, to understand, uh, given that we've navigated two years of a pandemic, I'd like to understand from a couple of you uh, what we've learned over those two years and what it is what is it that we're bringing forward with us into the future. And then for the other two panelists, just to keep things um, spiced up, I want to have a conversation about our people and about what we've learned from the work that the natural resources sector has done and continues to do really well around reconciliation and um, the path forward that you're that you're laying and what other businesses not just in the natural resource sector can learn from you so susan i'll start with you on the first one um, in terms of um, what have we learned what has the natural resources sector learned from the pandemic that we're going to be bringing forward with us well, I, I think that we've learned that, I mean, if, if you think about the start of the pandemic, if you heard the word pivot one more time, you thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to just scream. But that's in fact what we had to do as a sector. Um, you know, we were all faced this with this immediate shutdown and then we had to kind of say, okay, how can we address this incredible challenge in a way that allows us to continue to operate in a safe way? And that sort of said stepping back and looking at our business and talking to our people and saying, okay, 
how how can we do this and how can we do this in a way that keeps our 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 workers and our families and our communities safe and i think you know that was something that seems like a long time ago because we are so well versed at doing these <laughs> addressing through these changes now but that was a massive you know those first few weeks were really incredible and it took a lot of a collaboration with our workers with labor um, with our teams to try and find a way to do that and it and i think it says you know to us that in, when faced this big with this big challenge, if you pull the right people together, you can kind of find a solution that allows you to move forward. And I think that's something that we will take take uh, take forward. I think the second thing is is that we we learn that the you know Brian talked about the need for diversity, and we want to have a diverse economy. And it's been interesting because you know there's this sound of well we we should do all this, and we're going to move into the tech world, and that's the way of the future, and resources are the way of the past. It's just not the case. We need diversity, and I think the diversity of our com uh, our economy um, has helped us because we saw how consumer facing businesses faced a much and still you know face a very a difficult challenge getting back up and running uh, with the pandemic because of the, the the important public health measures that have been in place. But we know that diversity of economy has allowed for this natural resources sector to really lift up the province as a whole. And so as we're having these conversations about what is the way of the future, we have, I think, underscored again, the importance of diversity and particularly the natural resources sector. And, and I think um, the third thing is, is that we, <laughs> we have learned uh, that, that even more so, I mean, business has uncertainty attached to it, but we have to be nimble if we're going to capitalize on opportunities. And I think that has a thread that we really need to pull on as we, as we think about the future opportunities that we have in the province of broader, British Columbia, we can as a collective capitalize on them. Um, but to do that, you have to be nimble. You have to have the right conditions. And I think that's something that we're ever mindful as we continue to move our way out of this pandemic and take the lessons that we have learned along the way. Follow up on the word nimble. What, is, what does nimble look like? How can, how can we be nimble or more nimble? Was that back to me or is that to, yeah. to another? Yeah, I just want to drill down on the word yeah, nimble. Sure. How can we be well, more I nimble? Think I, I think what if you, if you have a strong uh, understanding of your operating environment and you you know what the conditions are uh, that you are going to need to drive forward, that helps. And I think you know the reason you know for our sector we have a lot of uncertainty, and that's that it's, it's disconcerting. Humans don't love uncertainty, but uh, particularly um, you know businesses don't like uncertainty. And so you know part of being nimble is having uh, an operating climate that allows you to kind of uh, move, which means you have you know consistent understanding of the operating conditions, the regulatory environment, and the rules of the game, and then that you can move fairly swiftly to capitalize on that and that takes that takes people in addition to cap to capital so i i think for us when we when i look at the opportunities ahead of us and i think about being nimble i think we need to have the right operating conditions the right investment climate um obviously the right people but we also need to be able to bring people to help us uh, capitalize on that opportunity including the investor absolutely Thank you for that. Brian, I'll, I'll pivot to you just for a second, just to build on, on Susan's comments, because uh, you spoke earlier about the importance of uh, diverse conversations pursuing multiple pathways. Um, what, uh, in your perspective, have we learned from the pandemic that we'll continue to bring forward with us? Well, I think what we, where we're at right now is that we need those multiple pathways. And Susan just talked about it right now, is we need to invest. I mean we need to we've been having these binary conversations that there's some sort of end state that we're trying to get to when we're on a journey folks and we're on an energy transformation journey and the industries that we're uh, talking about today are absolutely central to that and in fact we need to invest in them in order to continue down the journey and i think that's uh, uh that's sort of the the conversation we're not having right now we're having a conversation about perhaps doing much less of these industries which will actually not get the outcomes that we're that we're talking about. So we have we have to unpack a lot of that, and we don't have time to wait. 
We need to get uh, to get the investment in our communities. Why? Because of GDP and charts and graphs? No, because we want healthy, safe communities, because we want reconciliation, because we want to move forward as a country and take our place on the world stage. So I think it's a it's a time for the pit. When you talk about a pivot, the pivot is now the actions we take in the next six to 12 months in coming back together and actually operationalizing some things will set the stage for the next 20 years. And I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to look at that that way. No pressure on us, obviously, but there is, we've got to get this right. And we're not going to do it by not uh, empowering these industries. And so the time is now to, uh, to make that happen. Absolutely. The time is now to be courageous and to have conversations that we perhaps haven't had before. Before I jump to Kendra, because I'm going to pivot towards a conversation around people and Indigenous reconciliation, I would encourage the audience to uh, load up your questions onto Hoover so that we can begin to address the questions that you would like to have asked. Meantime, I'm going to continue to steamroll forward because I've got lots and um, uh, just to shift to, to Kendra for a second. So Kendra, you highlighted in your opening comments the importance of our people, the diversity of our people. The natural resources sector is known for its work around Indigenous reconciliation, its success around reconciliation. What do you think we've learned in the last couple of years around that, that we absolutely need to be bringing forward uh, with us as we plot the future? Yeah, that is a conversation that has uh, it just advanced so much over the last uh, five to 10 years. And, and it, it started many, many years before that, but it took a long time to, to get the, the respect and the, um, the platform that it, it really deserved. And I, I think we're, we're getting there now. There's again, still lots of work to do, but uh, the natural resource sectors have done a phenomenal job to this point uh, in building partnerships with our, our indigenous partners right across the province. Uh, we are some of the, the largest employers of First Nation people across the province. Um, and we know on the mineral exploration side, uh, the number of uh, First Nation vendors that we see throughout the supply chain uh, is actually quite remarkable. We're uh, releasing a economic impact study around the supply chain uh, in two weeks time at Roundup. So uh, those numbers will be freshed and uh, released at that point. But uh, it's it's really quite an impressive number to see how we are working together, those relationships that we're building. And it's more than just having the conversations. It's, it's building the economy. It's building the partnerships. It's building trust. It's building understanding. It's building community. Um, with with everybody who could be impacted, could benefit uh, from any one of these natural resource projects. So um, I, I think there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of conversation still to be had specifically around land use planning, um, an understanding of, of which pieces of land are, are sacred, which pieces of land are high potential for development, and finding that middle ground of, of how we can all work together. The other piece I, I did want to touch on, though, with regards to the people is that at, at our level, we all have a conversation and, and we meet and we, we speak regularly about where we're going and what we're doing and the challenges and opportunities that we all face. But I'd like to put it out to the membership as well and, and everybody who's watching. I think there's a phenomenal opportunity at the grassroots level, at the field site level to really work together. I spent the first uh, 15 or so years of my career uh, out in the field, living in camps. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they were, they were mineral exploration projects, but they're, they were based in forestry camps. Um, and to see that conversation and that understanding of the different industries at that level on the ground uh, gives you a different level of, of respect of, of what's going on and what's needed, what's required uh, within the other natural resources industries. So. I think at a, at a grassroots level, there's an opportunity to reach out, to work together, as Brian said, the diversity of conversation and understanding how we can help and support one another when we talk about land use planning and um, road usage and uh, you know different wildlife habitat areas. All of those things layer up and they all impact each one of us um, and each one of our projects. So uh, I'll, I'll issue a challenge, a call to action to, uh, to all the members to really Think about the others that are out in the field in your surrounding uh, and have those conversations with one another and elevate it both up up to the corporate office as well as right down into those field camps. So um, I will leave it there, Fiona, and back to you. 
Well said, and I love the call to action, which I'll be looping back with the panelists towards the end of this session. Um, you know, what is your call to action? What is your key message that you want to share with the audience today as we wrap up closer to 10.45? Michael, I'm going to come to you. I'd love your perspective on, on what we've learned over the last couple of years in terms of our people management, Indigenous reconciliation. The mining sector, along with the others, has been an absolute leader in that realm. Uh, what are your thoughts on what we've learned and what we need to be bringing forward with us? Thanks, Fiona. Uh, well, no question, the last two years have been extremely challenging. And um, I think there's a one of the things that I'd like to highlight is um, is collaboration. And um, well, many folks won't know this, but uh, early in the pandemic, um, we work closely with uh, the Ministry of Energy Mines and Low Carbon Innovation, um, along with uh, the Northern Health Authority um, and uh, other natural resource projects, kind of the big five um, in Northern BC, uh, TMX, Coastal Gaslink, LNG Canada, Rio Tinto Smelter, um, and uh, we call this kind of the uh, COVID consortium. And we all worked on a weekly basis uh, very hard to uh, ensure that we could keep operating and keep British Columbians employed. Uh, but the driver was to keep uh, local and Indigenous communities safe. Many of these uh, operations have camps. Many of them are our construction projects. Uh, but with respect to our mines, everybody was motivated by keeping uh, their local and Indigenous communities safe. Um, and, um, you know, we went so far as to work with uh, Northern Health to implement uh, rapid testing for COVID. And then when vaccinations uh, began to uh, hit the province, uh, we all came together to facilitate uh, their transport and delivery uh, to rural communities. Uh, so that was an excellent example, I think, of uh, folks in the natural resource sector coming together. Um, Another learning and what's become, I think, very important for all of us, uh, and that is um, uh, who's going to fill the jobs of tomorrow today in our sector. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in mining um, to look at uh, the new generation uh, of miners and to prepare uh, miners for the mine of tomorrow, uh, which is a, quite a high tech um, uh, operation. Um, you know, if you were to go and look at um, one of our members, Tech Resources, at their kind of uh, help wanted page, and that's an old reference, obviously, uh, go to their website uh, to where all their positions are. Um, it actually reads like a high tech company, uh, the, the jobs uh, uh, that they're trying to fill there. Um, a lot of folks don't know that. The, the younger folks that are coming out of school don't know that. Um, so there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, and one of the exciting things that we have coming this year uh, through the Center of Training and Excellence in Mining is uh, a, a roadmap um, that will be specifically targeting uh, Indigenous peoples and women underrepresented groups in BC and how we can get them involved in our sector. Um, to uh, kind of view mining as a uh, as a rising tide to lift all boats in 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 rural communities in BC, so we're very excited about that, and uh, I think that's something that has really uh, gained urgency in the last few years through the pandemic. Uh, noting that um, uh, many of the folks that suffered most through uh, the pandemic were women and, and underrepresented groups in BC. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michael, and, and thanks for referencing the roadmap that you're building for mining. It was one of the questions I had in my back pocket was, um, you know, there's going to be, given the, the reach and the size of the natural resources sector, there's probably likely jobs that haven't been created yet, jobs of the future. Um, there's a huge opportunity to attract uh, youth into the sector. Um, Kendra, you're nodding, so I'm going to jump to you. What is it that you're doing, that your sector is doing to um, engage youth, to paint the picture of the opportunity going forward and, and get youth into, uh, into the natural resource sector? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And it's a huge, huge challenge across natural resources. So um, really excited to, to see the skills map that's, uh, that's going to come up and, uh, you know, have, have been privy to some of that uh, work going into it. So we're really excited to see that. But uh, within the mining sector, we've got a number of, of programs at that early level. Um, there's a group called Minerals Ed that works really closely with uh, elementary and high school teachers uh, to get kids interested in, in the natural resource sectors. Uh, specifically, they, they look at the rock cycle, they look at um, the different impacts that um, the geology and, and geographic influences have on the planet and uh, formation of the planet and all those good things that uh, are really just engaging to kids and make them look at their natural environment and their surroundings in a different light. Uh, when we get into the university level programs, um, many of us in industry often go and do guest lectures at universities and talk beyond the academic um, portions that they're learning. So uh, to some of the things Michael spoke about, it's it's what do, what's the effects of um, and how do we engage with our First Nation partners? Um, how do we have those conversations? How do we embark on that? Um, some of the regulatory pieces, some of the advocacy pieces, the policy piece, those are things that the kids in universities don't necessarily get a lot of exposure to. And it's a really important piece to understand when you're coming into this industry. I think the other component that's often lost at that university level is, is the financial component. Uh, you know, people come out of university really excited to be a biologist or a geologist or environmental scientist. And, you know, they end up in, in any one of our industries and they don't really understand until later years in, in life of, of how the industry actually ticks and how it keeps moving along and, and some of these other components, including how it gets um, financed throughout and specifically for mineral exploration, that's, uh, you know, it, it's not an obvious one. It, there's there's no revenues associated with it. So it's, uh, it's not obvious for sure. So uh, there's lots of work going on uh, to engage the younger generations. We're hosting Roundup in two weeks time. And uh, we always have uh, a number of youth come and, uh, and interact. There's mentorship programs. I know you've got a, a mentorship program as does the uh, Vancouver Board of Trade. Um, and Amy has one as well. So uh, really looking to some of those um, mid-career and senior career folks within the industry to, to have those conversations and to start to engage and uh, build that thought pattern, but also help those next generations who are really, really passionate about ESG um, topics and, and, you know, critical minerals and, and where their um, where their products are coming from that they're using, making sure that they understand that we want to build those products. We want to source those products from British Columbia and having some of the highest ESG measures and regulations of anywhere in the world, that it's really important that those products come from right here in our backyard. And the way to do that is through natural resource development. Thanks, Kendra. Guys, we have, ah, I was going to ask what's happened to the questions. That's great, because I hadn't seen any questions up until this point. Um, let me take a quick peek at what we're seeing here. Thank you, everybody, for um, contributing. Um, let's go to a question asked by Sheely, because it's going to touch the panel. As shifts happen in our resource sectors, do you feel there's enough support to assist workers in transferring their skill sets? And are we still seeing a large gap in skilled workers? So just building off your comments, Kendra, I'll open it up to the panel. Um, how are we retooling? Are we retooling? Are we upskilling, reskilling um, the, the folks who are currently in the industry to meet the demands of the future workforce as well as bringing uh, youth in? Anybody want to take that question? I'll give it a you shot. Know, that's like Brian, okay, let's go. Sorry. I, I think it speaks to the false narrative we've got out there. Our natural resource sectors are tech sectors. We are constantly innovating all along the pathway. And I think that the, the conversation that's being had out there is the transition of industries. Well, we've always been in a transition and a transformation. And it goes to, to what Kendra was just talking about. How do we attract uh, the solvers to our industry? And when we're having a national dialogue about less of our industries, well, how do we attract solvers to it? We need all the best and brightest minds coming to our industries to help us do what we do best. The Canadian thing that we do, which is produce natural resources responsibly, which is why we've built these centers of excellence in technology and engineering across the, you know, particularly in Vancouver. So I'll, I'll just say that, like that, that this is a constant process and we're in the midst of it and world leading at it right now. So. I'll just leave with that. 
Good points, Brian. Thank you. Does anybody else want to respond to that question before we keep moving? We've got four Fiona, minutes. I don't, but I, Brian, I, I'd uh, like, Michael. Yeah, I'd like to actually shift into something and, and kind of comment on a, a point that Susan made about um, the regulatory environment in BC. Because uh, we have so much potential here. We have um, very strong environmental, social, and governance performance, and it's only getting better year over year. Uh, but one of the things that we really need to focus on um, is our, our permitting and regulatory processes. Um, you know, in mining um, right now, and this is, I have a bit of a different perspective than Kendra, um, who's really focused on the on the exploration side, whereas our members are, uh, you know, operating mines and smelters. Um, and it's become very challenging um, to be, you know, permitting, uh, it's not predictable, it's not timely, it's very complex, and it just takes uh, uh, too much uh, effort, an inordinate amount of effort to get things done. To be fair, uh, Minister Ralston and his staff uh, last year began a regulatory review process and we're very pleased um, that that is moving along to enhance permitting and authorizations of mines. Uh, there has been progress made, but more work needs to be done. And Susan mentioned uh, the word predictable. That's critical. And um, I think it's important for everyone to know in, international investors have an eye on British Columbia. And they, one of their key concerns is uh, permitting risk. Um, I know folks in Victoria have got their eye on that and we're encouraged by that, um, but they've got to keep their, their foot on the gas um, uh, because the pendulum has kind of swung the other way when it comes to permitting. Uh, no one is suggesting that we deregulate. No one is suggesting that we reduce environmental protections. This is more about process and, um, and about efficiency. It's a critical Fiona, point. I know we're running short of time, but I'm wondering if I can jump in on that. And I want to try and address this question that has 20 votes too, but I know we're can short you, of time. So yeah, moderate. One, one yeah, minute. I, got one minute. I would just say um, it's a really important question. And I think, um, first of all, the fact between 2009 and 2019, the BC industry invested $14 billion in the province of British Columbia. Uh, they have also made investments outside, and that's not unusual. As you're looking to supply your global customers around the world and you're looking for places where you have more fiber, people are also going to make decisions to invest in other jurisdictions. Diversity in a portfolio is important. You don't buy one stock in your RSP. I think, though, in investor certainty is really important. And that was, you know, the quote from Paul Quinn that BC for the forest industry has become uninvestable is really important. And I think we need to change that because the way that it's about fiber and we have a decreasing fiber supply. We know that from beetles and fires. And so we can produce fewer products here. We, however, can invest in the future if we can attract investment. But the way we are right now, for instance, there's 2.6 billion uh, million hectares that are uh, under uncertainty right now with the decisions around old growth. And I don't think you would make an investment. You wouldn't buy a house if somebody could take it back without compensating you for it. For it. So we, we really need to create some certainty so that people can make further investments in the province of British Columbia in the natural resources sectors represented here and including in forestry. Well said. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, uh, Michael, for raising the point. Folks, sadly, we are out of time. I would love to continue this conversation. 45 minutes is not nearly enough. Um, we could go for quite some time, as you know. Thank you, though. Thank you to the panelists, uh, Michael Goring, Kendra Johnson, Susan Yurkovic, and Brian Cox. Thank you to the audience for your questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to nearly uh, all of them uh, in the time allotted, but I wish everybody um, a really good forum. I hope and, and expect that it'll stretch our thinking and it'll inspire our next thoughts and our next steps. So thank you to everyone. And uh, Sarah, I'll hand back to you. That brings us to the first coffee break of the day from 10.45 to 11.15. Don't forget to check out our virtual exhibitors. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We'll see you back online at 11.15 for the next session, Attracting Sustainable Investment to British Columbia.